Hey friends, if you know me, then you know doing these interviews is my favorite thing to do on this channel. I get to sit down and talk to the people who bring these books to life, the publishers, the authors, the artists. And in this video, I talked to Art Werger, who created the artwork for Suntup's editions of The Godfather. And his chosen medium is intaglio prints, which is an archaic method to creating art. I think it was done back in the 1600s. So before you get into the video, I need to give you a little insight into the techniques used and that, that we're describing. We just kind of jump right into it because before I did this interview, I got a couple of videos showing this process to me from art. And those videos are available on the Suntup website. So you go check those out. But if you watch this interview without seeing those videos first, you need to know that we're talking about two techniques, mezzotint and aquatint, which involve the artist etching an image onto a copper plate, then loading that plate with ink and then pressing that image onto uh, a page. That's the very simple way to talk about how this very labor intensive technique is done. Uh, I do encourage you to see those videos on how, how it's actually performed because it's mind blowing how these images are created. But during this interview, we sort of just jump right into it. I'll link to the appropriate places in uh, the description of this video, including Art's website, which houses other process videos. And I do encourage you to go check it out and, and see some of the stunning work he's created in with this beautiful technique. And that's all I'll say for now. I think Art says everything a lot better than I could. <laughs> he's definitely a master. You could see some of his artwork um, on the Suntub page. I, I share some of it here, as well as some of his sketches. So. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I had a blast. I definitely got an education. And um, I hope you enjoy the video as much as I enjoy the conversation. Uh, for once, I'm not talking to myself. It's time to go beyond the book and get over your shell. Thank you for joining me. This is one thing I love about collecting and my role in the collecting community is talking to the people who create these things because I love the written word, but there's a certain magic that happens when art in key scenes highlights the written word and, and works with it to create an amped up experience. And I think what Suntup does well is, uh, well, they do many things well, but one thing they excel at is finding an artist to match the work. And so I, I do like getting the perspectives of the people who, who are handpicked and create works that match in tone, technique, and, and whatever the case may be. And uh, this is certainly no exception. So um, thank you for joining me. And I think the first thing I was curious about um, with all of what you're doing is how did you get attracted to this art form? It's the, it's the beauty of it. I love drawing and a specific way of drawing. When I was uh, learning, I became uh, very dedicated to drawing at about the age of 13. Uh, and the way that I preferred to draw was uh, from black to white. So starting with uh, charcoal and then erasing a drawing out of that from a scratch board, which is a black ink coated board, you scratch and you see the white. And so uh, I trained as much as I could in drawing. I went into illustration for a little while, but when I found printmaking with these black to white methods, uh, that was it. I was hooked. These media, which have been around for hundreds of years, have had a real renaissance uh, especially since the, the 70s, which is where, when I was learning. They constantly challenge. You might look at my work. Other people might look at work, my work and think I'm a master. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's always a surprise. And it's always a dialogue with the medium. When you look at the finished work, it has, it has a, a, a wonderful quality to it. But the amazing part of it for me was watching it develop. When I saw you wiping the ink off, it is yeah. like a picture is getting developed. Right, right. And where does it come from? I know I worked really hard on it. I know I know what I'm doing to some degree, but still it comes from somewhere else. 
I think that was a great point you made in the video where you're like, it's always a reveal to me as well. Because you're, you're dealing with this black sheet of copper and then, and then you wipe it down and then there it is. How hard is it to change once you've done that? Yeah, you can um, manipulate the plate in a lot of different ways. You can make it either darker or lighter as the need be. Uh, but there's something about the integrity of the process that I try to achieve it all with the very first time it's printed. Some people will like to do one process, a line and some texture and then some value and then something else. And they might take it through 10 different stages. And sometimes I work that way. But with these, it was all an attempt at all or nothing. So if it, if it doesn't work out, yeah, I can manipulate it a little bit. I can make areas lighter or darker, but the surface is different. And so it might, might look like a correction in those passages. For me, the, the laborious process of all the different rounds of, of handling this piece. Now, I, I will admit painters and, and people who work in oil paints and acrylics and all these other forms, media are, are doing labor. You know, they uh -huh. sketch, they outline, they, they put layers up to get different colors. But for me, there, there's a balance between, it almost feels like carpentry. Yeah, and I try to uh, expedite things as quickly as possible. Uh, so for instance, with the mezzotint, which is the medium that the frontispiece is done in, the made man, um, that is really known as laborious process, going back to the 1630s, uh, and was not really used as a creative medium until the last 20 years or so. I Try to demystify that for a long time I was making one a mezzotint from beginning to end every day and just trying to maintain that production and to date I've made over 500 mezzotints which I believe is the record wow. <laughs> for anybody making just I'm not the quality but just the number of mezzotints that's a lot <laughs> it's a lot uh, yeah and and I must say to the viewers who are watching this <laughs> If if you want to to go check the videos out, I believe Suntup is sharing them in some capacity. I'll I'll link in the description to this video. So uh, to be absolutely clear, if they're not available right now, I'm sorry, but get over to Art's website to see some of that process, it, just in general to know what we're talking about, because it is it is captivating. It I, I'm a, I'm a sucker for how it's made type videos. I I yeah. do love that process. Um, to get the behind the scenes, but there's some, something really special about this process that just struck something with me. It's Art Werger, A-R-T-W-E-R-G-E-R.com under process. I've got a bunch of educational videos in there. Since I'm not teaching anymore, I'm retired. I'm still teaching vicariously through the website. <laughs> now, I know the process is different with the mesotint and the aquatint. The main difference between mesotint and aquatint, while the end results may look similar, is that mesotint is done entirely by hand. You rough up the surface of a plate and then you smooth it. Whereas aquatint is an etching process, so that's done with acid. The acid eats the metal away. So you don't use the rocker at all on the aquatint? No. So you're drawing in the negative and uh, through stages, as well as in the mirror image, so the uh, plate will flip when it's printed on paper. Uh, so there's some mental constructs, some mental, mental acrobatics you have to go through. Yeah, and you don't have to do hours of rocking. When, when you pulled out that tool to do the rocking for you, uh, you still do that for hours? Traditionally, yes. I will admit, though, I now buy pre-rocked plates. Having done 500, my elbows, my shoulders. Yeah, I, I, I'm like, there has to be a machine you could just insert it in, and it just rocks it for you. You'd think, but it's not so simple. Even a, a machine rocker needs careful supervision. And oh. so rare to find plates that are well machine rocked, but they do exist. Interesting. So is this gotten more popular? Um, the the into intaglio, is that how you say it? Intaglio. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the, the Italian pronunciation, but in, in America we say intaglio. Um, okay. uh, it has gotten popular. Mesotint has gotten really popular in the last, uh, 20 to 30 years. And there was, until recently, with the uh, problems in Russia, the International Mesotent Festival in Russia every two years. 
So I was lucky to, I received a grand prize. I was lucky to go there a couple of times and uh, experience the camaraderie of all of these artists around the world who love working in mezzotint. And it's like a groundswell of Luddites. I don't know, anti-technical people. No, not really, but people who love this medium that they found, the, the rich values of it, um, the look of it, the mystique of it. And uh, so, yeah, I hope that will continue in some form in spite of our you know, closed off relationships with Russia now. Since Russia is hosting it, is it more popular in the East, in Russia? No, it's all over the world, really. Okay. Artists from all countries would uh, convene in Yekaterinburg, uh, Russia, which is where the uh, Yekaterinburg Museum uh, decided they were going to become the, the museum in the world for mezzotint. I'd yeah. imagine from the artist getting that feeling of you, the creating is on multiple levels and very, very, I, I don't know, it just seems more tactile. Yeah, it's it's a physical, it's almost like low sculpture, very low relief sculpture. Uh, but the appearance of it is so rich uh, and uh, like a velvety black, such a soft, rich, velvety black. I equate it to uh, traditional uh, Renaissance chiaroscuro and also to film noir. I'm a big cinematic. Uh -huh. So uh, the, you know, a dark room and there's just light on the things which tell the story. Uh, that's the approach that I love. Now, if somebody showed you a, a print and said, is this aqua tint or mezzotint, would you be able to identify just yes, by seeing I, them? I would, but not, not many people could easily. <laughs> what, would be, what would be something somebody would look at to, to see those differences? The textures. When you look close, you can see the texture of the mezzotint, the mark of the rocker, and the scraping and burnishing on that surface, or the grain of the rosin, which is the acid-resistant powder, which is used for the aquatint process. So those things are visible to those in the know, at least. So in, uh, in Suntup's edition of Godfather, the frontispiece mm -hmm. is mezzo, and the rest of it is aquatint. Yes, yes. Okay. I would have looked all in mesotint but uh, uh your arms would, would have fallen off well that and we'd need a few more years i think to complete the project because the one thing i thought and i was confused on is in the video you said the the plate is good for about a hundred prints mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean <laughs> that doesn't mean you put the ink on and you get a hundred prints you have to put the ink on get a print put the ink on get a print right and that's part of the process that keeps the artist humble, that you've got to do this physical labor. Uh, but I love it. Um, and yeah, you can print, you know, usually up to maybe a hundred before the plate starts to get weak and the image gets lighter and more irregular at a certain point. And then what do you do? Well, you can steel face the plates. And that puts a molecular uh, coating on it, which allows to extend the addition for a couple hundred more. Uh, usually at that point, I'm tired. I'm ready to move on to something more creative and start something. That's interesting. So for for uh, The Godfather, did how did you get? I mean, you had to do what, 350? How many plates did, how many no. prints? No, we made... Um, I made editions of 25 of the individual prints and 25, which are going to be a boxed set of portfolio set that I'm creating. Uh, but then Suntup decided they wanted um, to use the actual etchings and mesotint in their small edition of 26. So okay. I think another 35 at that point. And for those, I had to steel face the plates to make sure they didn't break down. Ah, and then, and so uh, the the ones in the other editions are reproductions. Those are reproductions, okay. as every other book, but the small edition, oh, yeah. actual prints in it. How did you go about deciding what photos or, or what, what photos, what images to capture for the book? It was um, a tough decision because it's such an epic, sweeping story, really, if you know the the movie of The Godfather, uh, both books, uh, both movies are in incorporated into the one book and extended stories dealing with the singer character. 
Um, and so, you know, there's so many different characters, so many different settings, so many different iconic scenes. I think um, we started with uh, six illustrations and I'm like, there's no way I can do this in six <laughs> illustrations. There's six, wow. are, there's six main characters, there's six settings, there's six iconic moments. Yeah. And so it grew and grew. Um, it ends up there's 14 uh, illustrations in the book. I did an additional two illustrations for the uh, portfolio. Nice. So the 16 that I did all together. And I, I couldn't help. I watched Godfather last night. And okay. uh, I, I couldn't help noticing uh, none of the illustrations have Pacino or Marlon Brando in them. That is the big challenge because I'm not illustrating the movie. I'm illustrating the book. Uh right. Right. The top rope uh, is to not disappoint people who have these iconic images of the movie in their head, which is most Godfather fans, perhaps more of the movie than the book, right. uh, not to disappoint that and yet keep to the character types. So, you know, I'm drawing in the negative. I'm drawing uh, backwards. I'm trying to get the right expression. I'm drawing Michael, but I'm not drawing Al Pacino. And yeah. uh, yeah, that was a, a, a real difficult balance to maintain. I did love the way you created uh, the image for um, the horse head scene. If nobody knows the book or movie by now, I can't, I can't, I can't feel sorry for you if these are spoilers. But uh, the the <laughs> when I was watching the movie last night, I thought, how the hell did they get the horse head in a bed with a sleeping man right there? <laughs> Uh, and, and so when you captured oh, I, it, I don't even want to question it. You just go with it. Yeah, right, right. And in that image with just the shadow on the wall, that that sort of the message is getting sent uh, vibe of that moment was really cool. And I will say, I had even greater respect for that, knowing how you had to create a shadow on a wall, but still have imagery under that shadow. That's a little more complicated. It is. I had a, an, an inspiration for that uh, image. Uh, first of all, in the book, the horse's head is not in the bed. It's at the foot of the bed. Okay. And so Coppola turned that into a real horror story moment, very effective. Yeah. Uh, and that's what everybody remembers. Um, but uh, in thinking about uh, that image, it's titled The Sleep of Reason, which is stealing from Goya a little bit. Um, and this is most famous etching and aquatint from Los Caprichos, wow. which with the um, uh, problems with the Catholic Church in his era and a lot of surrealistic kind of imagery. But this image came to mind as I was working on that's that scene from the godfather and this character is asleep is he asleep is he awake does he think of the horse is the horse shadow really cast there or is that in his sleeping mind in huh. the yeah waking and sleeping so keeping that mystery was part of the idea that was a really great way for a challenging scene now i i noticed on your website you had a lot of uh works that actually have color in them as well yeah how do you get the color? Uh, well, my color methods are um, a little bit different, I think, than other printers. Instead of using, say, four copper plates, one for yellow, one for magenta, one for cyan, one for black, um, I use two plates. And to get a full spectrum from two plates, I use one for warm colors and put different colors in different patches and one for cool colors and put different colors in different places. And through a sequence of proofing and examining the results, find a sort of puzzle solution to uh, get a kind of a full color image from a warm plate and a cool plate. There is a, a, a video on that process in the um, uh, process page of my oh, website. Okay. Yeah. How did Suntup approach you? They saw my work in a gallery somewhere. I, you know, I just, I put it out there and they happened to see it, which was a great uh, happenstance and great timing just as I was retiring and was able to take the project on in full. 
Wow. Uh, so I think, yeah, they saw an, a, a combination of my love for film noir and cinematic storytelling with the subject matter. Uh, so something connected with them, luckily, and it all worked out. When you work with them, you, you do do a composite sketch. So is that what you showed Suntop with saying, this is what I'm thinking of creating? Yeah, I showed a lot of um, sketches in my sketchbook as I was coming up with ideas. And actually, I started just by going online and finding photographs of old gangsters and drawing them with the crosshatch pen and ink style and just wow. getting food for it. That really got me uh, excited about the prospects and then trying to, you know, fit them to the Godfather and the specific narratives um, was a good challenge. I was trained as an illustrator for a couple of years, but... Uh, really haven't done a big illustration project um, since the 70s. So it's it was time. Now, had you read the book before uh, taking on this project or just seen the movie? I grew up in uh, northern New Jersey in the 70s. Okay. <laughs> Might have been a little bit more uh, Sopranos than Godfather, but a uh, very Italian neighborhood. And when I got to high school, a lot of the older kids were carrying around older books. And they also had a, a little black book which I thought was the Bible, but no, it was the Godfather. Wow. That was the cool thing to be carrying around at that time. And so <laughs> I remember in study hall, everybody's passing the book around and saying, read page 26. Oh, wow. You know, that's how we learned about sex. So yeah. <laughs> it was a very kind of niche thing, uh, but it was, it was the biggest selling paperback book, book at the time. And everybody... Uh, was aware of it. I had read passages of it. I'd never read the entire book. Because I, I knew it was a book, and I, I know they kept attaching a name, Mario Puz, Puzo, Puzo, <laughs> to the to the book, and, and it, or the title of the movie. But for me, it was just always Marlon Brando, and, and you know, that has become, it's, it's another one of those movies that have just become part of the cultural DNA. Oh, yeah. And, it's sort of like you know it without ever having watched it or or been a part of it. And the movie is very dark. I, I was marveling at it. I'm like, didn't yeah. Francis Ford Coppola believe in any lighting? But everything is so dark. Dark in lighting, but also dark in mood. And so yeah, right. you know, growing up in an Italian neighborhood, um, not neighborhood, but it's Italian suburbs, basically. Uh, one thing that was missing for me is that the people that I knew were such huge personalities, yeah. funny as hell, great yeah. story. And so I wanted to bring a little bit of that sense of humor, which uh, was not in the, the movie rendition, I believe. Yeah, I, uh, I worked as a Teamster for about 11 years um, on, the, on Chicago's produce market, huge Italian American population. We're right by Taylor Street. And, and, and when I started working there, the stories of the mafia being kind of eased out of the union, at least visibly, were, uh, were, were still echoing and reverberating. By the time I started there, it was, it was past, but they would talk about the time that uh, somebody started their car with a remote click because uh, they didn't want to get blown up. So what do you do with the, t the the plates once you've done this? Do you sell the plates? No, I just hold on to the plates. Traditionally, they are... Um... Uh, defaced so that they can't be printed anymore. It's very hard to scribe a big X across the plate that you've been so precious and loving with for so long. But that is the, the tradition. Yeah, I don't know how you could do that. Can you? Now, that's the tradition, but couldn't you just keep them in a frame? Sometimes I like to show the plates, for sure. And, you know, some of the old plates, like Rembrandt's plates, are still uh, available. I mean, they've been, they've been passed down and they're not as strong as they used to be, but prints were taken after the initial run uh, in, you know, I don't know how many different editions. So if you're looking at Rembrandt plates, it's, you know, was it printed during his lifetime? Was it printed a hundred years, uh, 200 years later? Um, and you can tell by looking at the quality of the resulting image, uh, how good it is to some degree. This is so new to me. I had no idea Rembrandt used this technique, anybody really, I would have no idea. Yeah, Rembrandt was kind of the first and the best uh, when you, I mean, he, he was a painter, a portrait painter beyond compare. Uh, you look at those images and they are just alive, but you look at his etchings and they have a life and a spontaneity that was uh, entirely different because it's a different 
medium. It's a more personal medium. And the, the nice thing about uh, prints is they're not usually meant to be put up on the wall and seen across a vast space. They're meant to be held in hand. So it's a one on one relationship. It's a very intimate relationship as it was with the artist drawing the work. When you're saying it was, it's a very personal experience. That's the impression I got when I was watching the videos of how you're, you're really interacting <laughs> pun intended on a deep level. Like you're, 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 <laughs> putting you're pushing the art into the world and then working again in that negative like you're trying to create the light from from this plate it has to use a different sort of eye than putting light on a piece of paper you're drawing it out of a plate yeah it's it's a very different medium i've been doing it for almost 50 years in various forms and uh, yeah i do a lot of drawing also when i draw i usually draw on black paper um i don't really paint much um, I tend to use the tools of the printmaker, which tend to be a little bit more physical, uh, so that there's direct contact between the needle and the metal plate, rather than using a stick that has hair on it, that has goo on it, that has, well, that's, yeah, that's yeah. like, I don't feel control when I'm painting. <laughs> I consider that as well, because you are, you are making that line that is the line. That is uh, pushing it yeah. back down the, with the burnisher or with the acid, which which that to me feels more like illustration because you're you're drawing you're you're putting it on this tin, this copper. Do you use any other metals, by the way? Uh, I mostly use copper at this point. It can be done on steel. It can be done with a little bit a coarser effect. It can be done on uh, zinc, which is the more traditional but more dangerous. Uh, acid to be working with. Oh, uh, I was trained with zinc and nitric acid. Wow. So that was rather caustic. And then went to copper with Dutch mordant, which puts off chlorine gas. Oh. That was not much better. Wow. Uh, but gradually shifted to ferric chloride, which is actually a salt, a corrosive salt. And so that doesn't put off fumes. It, it's kind of dirty to deal with. Um, but it's much safer in terms of uh, health processes. I was wondering that as well with, with the ink you're rolling out, with the uh, acids you're using for aqua tint. Are you worried about getting any sort of contaminant, uh, any poisoning, any, you have to be very careful, I'm assuming. Yeah, you have to be careful. And mostly, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it's the older techniques, which were more uh, dangerous. Uh, a lot of people work with water-based inks now. I'm still using oil-based inks, but I'm always wearing uh, gloves. And so I have very little actual contact with the ink. Um, but, you know, I've been doing it for many, many years. And I had developed a, a reaction to uh, using mineral spirits for cleanup at the end of the day. And so I always turn on an exhaust fan and I use mm -hmm. a different solvent now. Uh, but these things do build up over time. And so one has to be cautious if you're going to, you know, if you do it once, it's probably not a problem. But if you're going to do it for a lifetime, you have to have good techniques. Now, you said you, you're retired now, so you had opportunity to work on um, on this edition. Have you done work on any other books? No, not yet. I'm open to the prospect, but uh, this was the first uh, real big book project. It's a hell of a book project. It, ha <laughs> it has been. Other than that, I've Going, going out and doing a lot of landscape drawing. So I, I do a lot of plein air drawing, just going out into the scene and seeing what I can capture. That's that's nice. Now, is there a book you would want to do? Is there like one you're like, oh, this would be perfect for me? <laughs> oh, there's so many. Uh, <laughs> just looking at what Suntup has uh, done. I did, um, I did a project on Kurt Vonnegut and uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, uh, just an individual work a couple of years ago. And I saw that they just published uh, Slaughterhouse Five as well. That would have been a good one. That would have been, yeah. King books uh, would be wonderful. Yeah, all of those uh, things, especially yeah. the things which have a sort of a nostalgic feel to them. Right. I could see Rosemary's Baby. Um, the art oh, yeah. they, they, the artist they chose for Rosemary's Baby was black and white art and it was very rich in tone. So that, I, I think would have been perfect. This is, I think it's a home run all the way around. And I haven't even seen the finished book. Have you seen the finished book? I have not seen what it's going to look like in its different uh, formats. I do have my portfolio, which is kind of based on the 
original book cover. So this oh. is along with the uh, trailing blood here. So are you doing that or is Suntup doing that? This is my own uh, part of the project. I like that. I like that a lot. That's that's really cool. And while their small edition book will have the prints printed uh, bleed to the size of the pages, the portfolio will have two additional uh, images beyond the, the book presentation. It's incredible because there, there are many steps in the process where it seems like you keep getting these sort of reveals <laughs> where you, mm -hmm. you wipe it down, then you print it. And I even like the embossing around the, the print from the, from the roller. Oh yeah. The embossing is a very important physicality to it. That's what, you know, reaches out towards the viewer to pull the viewer in. It's like a mat. How much is that big roller? How much does that weigh? Like, what is it pushed down? It's about uh, 3,000 pounds, uh, the whole press. The roller is, ooh, I think that's about 600 pounds. And that 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 top roller, that really big roller, is key to getting a good mesotint. You know, you can, you can do the process basically anywhere, but you got to bring it back to a good press to get a good image from it and not destroy anything either i think is there is there a balance i mean you just want to push it as hard as you can right you're trying to get the maximum number of good impressions from that plate usually and as i said you can get up to a hundred uh if you print it with just the right amount of pressure if you don't have enough pressure it's going to look a little bit weak or speckled uh and if you have too much pressure you might only get 10 prints out of it instead of a hundred so it's important so, to find that perfect balance. How long would it take you to get 100 prints? Depending on the size. Uh, when I go into production, I'll have a couple of assistants working with me. So I'm doing the inking up. They're doing the actual clean work. Uh, and with working on small plates, we can print up to 200 in an afternoon. It's okay. just really production work at that point. Well, I, I appreciate you taking the time today to, to chat with me about these. I know... We love this stuff, especially in the SunTub group, to see the printmaking, the techniques behind the scenes, and then the finished product. I, I have a much deeper appreciation for those pieces that, um, that Paul sent me before we, we did this interview after seeing how they're created. Oh, great. It, it, it's magic. It really is. It, it blows my mind that we've created this technique in the first, that people have done this, you know? <laughs> And they, they, they figured it out so early on. Like mesotent was 1630. Jeez. First tonal reproduction, long before lithography, before aquatint, before photography, halftone, you know, computers, all of that. Uh, so for that to be having this revival in the last 20 years is really kind of uh, uh, a miracle. Yeah. And I, I think there is a, a hearkening back. You know, I think it's sort of a, I would think my uneducated guess that seems probably like a pushback to everything being so tech heavy, so removed from the creation process. We have AI now where people just say, give yeah. me this type of image and it just turns it out. We're losing that connection to the art. I, I've been thinking about that. You know, could I just type in uh, uh, a rich guy sleeping in a bed and a horse's head shadow and <laughs> have the whole thing come up? Who knows what it'll be? It won't be quite the same. No, no. It, it, you know, even even images that are beautiful, but created by an, a machine, you could fall into a beautiful image from AI, sure. And yeah, but it, it, it there's just you you lose that humanity. You lose a soul of, of the art well, at this point. But in 10 years, who knows? I mean, <laughs> what's really disheartening about it for me is that if technology has not loosened up the workload so that people can pursue their creative pursuits more than what is the purpose of it? If it's, it's, if it's making us slaves to uh, more uh, boring things and they're doing all the creative, if the machines are doing all the creative work, we've got it inverted. We should be exploring our humanity with whatever leisure technology can bring us. Yes. Yes. I think uh, for me, art and human expression is the pinnacle of human existence. Exactly. Otherwise, what is the point? It's just survival and and existing another day. But 
And, and the problem is for young people learning how to do these things. They're like I can struggle with drawing and uh, it's so hard to understand the world and to be able to make something meaningful come out of that pencil in my hand versus typing in a prompt. Yeah, <laughs> right. But there's nothing like drawing. And that is for me, uh, the key to it. Well, it, it definitely shows. And uh, I think it elevates this edition to something that people are going to have on their shelves for generations, no lie. And I think um, that's, that's a unique honor. And I, I you, you totally deserve it. Um, that is some brilliant work. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking with you.